broadcasting live today from the state capitol building in Pierre and seated at the table with me here, South Dakota Attorney General Jason Roundsburg. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lori. It's good to be back. All right. We've got a new legislation, le legislative session. Lawmakers are here. You've got a list of priorities. And also yesterday, the Virginia State Legislature ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And I want to lay out some of uh, South Dakota's role in this conversation as there are hurdles still. Yes. Um, although there were big celebrations and claims of this historic moment. Not too fast. Um, wh first of all, tell me why uh, it was important for you as South Dakota Attorney General with the limited resources that you have to join two other states in saying um, don't go forward with the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, uh, first off is that, uh, yes, Virginia passed it. I think they have one more procedural step, and then we'll start the real battles, I would, I would say. But I... Uh, it was important for South Dakota to join because the legislature in 1979 put a sunset clause basically on the on their ratification. And so South Dakota has taken a position actually unique to all states. There are four other states that have rescinded their ratification, but South Dakota is the only one that really had a sunset clause on there. And so the last position of the legislature was that we did not want to be part of the Equal Rights Amendment. Then there is very, are a number of different uh, procedural arguments, and I think it does set a very bad precedent above and beyond the ERA. You can be for or against that, but the procedural that Congress does have the power to limit how long an amendment should be left open. They said it should be seven years. Then there was a discussion, and, and eventually there was a resolution passed to extend it three more years. Uh, there was a case out of the state of Idaho. Idaho rescinded it, and then the U.S. Supreme Court uh, let that case basically die and uh, labeled moot once it passed the deadline. And I think it's established a very bad precedent that we can reopen uh, amendments that are already uh, considered dead. And the United States Justice Department just agreed with us here recently, and the OLC issued an opinion saying that this is all nice and conjecture by Virginia and uh, in more recent times Nevada and Illinois, but they're about 40 years too late. So if you would like the ERA, then you need to go back through the legislative process and send it back to the states. And I think that is the proper role. Mm -hmm. um, the Attorney General of Virginia called the case repugnant, that uh, these three states, it's a very strong word for him to say repugnant when you heard that. What, were, what was your response? Well, I guess I didn't hear him say that, and I've met Mr. Herring and everything, but I respectfully disagree because he is seeking to get to the end solution where he wants to be regarding the ERA. I think there are a number of process steps for the amendment process. If there was an amendment that uh, maybe strengthened the Second Amendment or something that he did not like and was going through the same procedure, I think he'd have a very different position. I think that everybody should be transparent and open about what the process is, We've only amended our United States Constitution 27 times, and obviously 10 were as a uh, package with the Bill of Rights, so we don't do that lightly. So I think that we should amend the United States Constitution where everybody's in agreement. They're supposed to build consensus. That's why they sent it to the states, and there are five states that are actively saying, we, we did not support the ERA anymore. Mm -hmm. So those states, I think, also will be bringing lawsuits, I've heard. Uh, to seek to have theirs, uh, their papers back, and uh, we'll see what the courts do. Ultimately, I do believe it will go to the United States Supreme Court. As a procedural point, if the South Dakota State Legislature today, in this session, passed something that was symbolically indicative of their support of the, and I'm totally hypothetical right now, I've, no one has a plan for that that I'm aware of, um, does that change this, or is it not symbolic to you, it's procedural to you, and um, this has to be followed out because of those procedures? Well, I guess I wouldn't say it has no consequence or something of that value. And I've heard actually some legislators talking about that yeah. or bringing a bill or, or a resolution in some fashion, and I guess we'll see what they say. But I still believe we are 40 years too late. There, It was sunsetted in 1979 or 82, depending on what your argument is, but either date did not make the 38 requirement that Congress had prescribed. I think we need to start over. And I think that would also off actually be healthy for the country. Let's have a discussion about it in modern times. You know, I don't think that the ERA that they passed in 1972 are some of the things that they contemplated today. And I think we, there are a number of things that have been improved upon, you know, since the time of the ERA. What happens next? 
in well, this case. Well, we're, yeah. we're, uh, we're obviously in negotiations and talking with the uh, Office of Legal Counsel about our case. There's a case that's been filed in Massachusetts as well, and there's a case I assume will be coming once Virginia goes through the last procedural hurdles. They'll send their documents to the uh, archivist. It's my understanding he will not accept them or at least hold them in abeyance until the court uh, resolves, and uh, eventually we're going to I, I predict we'll be at the U.S. Supreme Court in some fashion. Yeah. For you, um, why is this worth um, your energy, the resources of South Dakota? Why this issue? Well, again, I think the United States uh, Constitution is a very important document, and our state has said that they are not in support of this amendment, and they also said that uh, I, th I do believe that the process of amending the Constitution is a very important process. Let's talk about what's happening in South Dakota uh, today and some of your legislative priorities. And you and I yeah, have I've already been to committee. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I have discussed some of this before, and I want to bring people up to date and then talk about moving these conversations forward. And one of them is uh, a Senate bill for the missing persons clearinghouse. Um, progress on that and some right. legislation. Uh, give people a quick background. It kind of starts with this missing and murdered indigenous people, and you've been very clear that all missing persons in South Dakota, we can do better um, with how we deal with those cases. Absolutely. Our, August, our office was charged in 1986 with finding missing and murdered pe uh, people in all varieties. And then last year, of course, SB 164 uh, keyed in on murdered and missing indigenous people. And so I think it's been a very positive development. I've went out and I've, I've talked to a number of our uh, Native American tribes as well. Uh, as you probably remember, there was a uh, lady found in the lake here uh, last year. And uh, she'd been missing for about two years, and nobody had reported her missing. So it's obviously very hard to find someone, and you don't know that you should be looking for them. I came into office. I looked at our website and some of our resources, and quite frankly, we had the same seven people on a, a database of missing people. And I said, well, we need to get updated with that. And then last year, like I said, the uh, bill came through. I thought that was a very positive step. And, and so today's bill uh, was SB 27. And it did pass committee, so I'm very happy about that. Seven to nothing, unanimous. And uh, I think they said it'll go to the consent calendar, so we're very happy that we're moving through the process. But I think that will give us some more resources. It'll give DCI, which works for me, our Division of Criminal Investigation, uh, more resources to get out to the public. Because the, all the statistics show it's in those first hours, those first few days, that you have the best success of finding people. And sometimes it's just a matter of some people have just moved away and they don't want to, you know, move on. And But it's a way if we can link together and get awareness out there. I know one sheriff told me that, you know, a son moved away to Minnesota, but he came up on a speeding ticket or something. So he wasn't really gone. He just moved away. But I think we build awareness for that. And then obviously there's cases that we get a lot of good awareness, you know, like the Serenity case out in Rapid City. I mean, it's got a lot of attention, but a lot of cases don't get the attention like mm -hmm. that. And we want to try and get people involved as much as we can. The woman found in the lake, what was her name? Uh, <laughs> I don't and that's part of this process, right? right? And I yep. say that for the point because I don't know the answer to that either. And part of the process is you have people who are missing, who are found, who are essentially nameless. And this is attempting to change not only the justice that's served, but the identification of who these people are. What I do, I think it gives people also, I mean, sadly, if we find them and they are uh, deceased, that it does at least give closure to the family and their community. And, uh, you know, try and helps us solve that. Let's talk about presumptive probation. Another okay. thing we've discussed before, it was important to you during the campaign. Yeah. Um, tell me a, a little bit about what you're hoping this legislative session will achieve uh, regarding presumptive probation. Well, I think the first thing last year that we achieved is we got a greater discussion going about it. And I hope that that will continue this year. And I, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm more resolved that the voice is getting louder, that it doesn't work. And so we are trying to figure ways to make it work better. We've always, I've always been for a carrot and a stick approach. I very much support the governor's uh, initiatives here where she's uh, trying to have more treatment, uh, more options. I think they put around 3.5 million, 3.7 million uh, into more treatment options. I definitely think that we need more treatment options. But I do believe that uh, you know we need cooperation too. We need people that are willing to cooperate and work with us so we can move up the chain. And we have been doing that, but it takes a lot more steps now because of presumptive probation. And, you know, there's no incentive to work with law enforcement. And we want people working with us to improve their lives, but also to take the drug dealers out of their communities. So we've brought one bill that seeks to address that, another bill, uh, it's kind of a three strikes, kind of like uh, you do when you get an ag assault now or a DUI. 
as your uh, conduct continues to be worse and worse as you go down the road, there are more and more consequences with a, a DUI or a simple assault. This is a 10-year ten, ten look back? 10-year look back. Okay. That's, that's modeled right so off of the DUI. Yeah, give me an example of how that works. <coughs> so what happens is uh, if you get convicted in a DUI situation, if you get a first, you know, you get it's a misdemeanor. Second, it's misdemeanor. And a third eventually becomes a felony in the 10-year period. We would be on the same type of model, and a uh, simple assault works the, very similar. But the on the here, you just lose the presumption. Now, the judge can still, within their discretion, uh, still give the person probation on the third instance here. They just lose the presumption. It just gives the judge wider latitude. And so we believe that after a while, you know, there should be potentially some consequences, and you look harder and harder at these cases. You don't just have a presumption right off the bat as you continue to get multiple convictions for felonies because I think we'll show uh, this year and we've talked about in the past it's not just using drugs it's burglaries it's assaults it's the other crimes that go with the use of methamphetamines the shooting in Sioux Falls at the in the parking lot at the uh, government center uh, the gentleman was coming at the police officer and he was high on methamphetamines they, they do feel invincible and and I think the officer acted very appropriately and I've, I've said so publicly with our report but that's just one example I think we can give you m numerous examples of burglaries and different crimes that are going with the unfortunate use of methamphetamine. So it goes back to this uh, this prevention campaign, which the governor launched uh, recently. Uh, this call during her state of the uh, budget address, I believe. I might not have that correct, but you know, for for increased uh, treatment facilities, and then this, you know, how how do we enforce this better and more efficiently and more effectively? These all go together to help the person who's addicted, but also for public safety. Do I understand the big picture here? Yeah. Yes, I, I do believe you do. Uh, the uh, I've always asked for balance board. I mean, I talked about a meth treatment center. I mean, that's expensive, but I do believe that that still is something that's needed. The more treatment options we can have, the better. I think more awareness that we have is better. So, you know, the governor's ad campaign has, you know, brought more awareness to the methamphetamine problem. You know, I do talk to people all throughout the state, and they're like, is meth really that big of a problem? And yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it affects every county in the state. There's not just, it's not just a Sioux Falls or Rapid City problem. It's all over. And we only busted seven labs in 2018. I haven't got the 2019 statistics yet, but only seven labs in state. Most all of these drugs are coming from out of state. It's actually coming from the cartels, predominantly from Mexico. And they're making it on an industrial level and just shoving it into America. It's, it's cheaper. And it's more potent yeah. than you could make uh, in your hometown garage uh, meth lab. And I want to go back to something you said about this sort of idea of cooperating. Um, because it's I think everybody can um, kind of intuitively get right away of how that would help public safety and how it helps law enforcement if someone cooperates. You can get the next person down the chain. How does it help the person who is trying to turn their life around? Um, and this is more of a symbolic question than well, a procedural question, but well, I think it uh, there's an opportunity there as well. I, well, I think it also, it also works both ways because, I mean, if I'm a drug dealer and I know that this program's out there where they have to work with law enforcement, I, we at least think that we're going to have them think twice about, you know, can I trust this person? Because if he gets caught, he's going to turn me in. So we do think that there's a element of incentive and deterrence in that factor. And then right now, you they literally can get out within 72 hours and they're back out and they're, they're, they don't give us the information of their dealer and they can go continue to use methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. So there's no incentive to turn in your dealer because you're gonna go out and get your high right away. Yeah. Well, if you again, take it off the marketplace or make the marketplace harder for them to get it, that's also a way of helping them get off of methamphetamines. But I do believe that we need more treatment options. The last time we actually spoke was a good year ago now. Well, uh, I've listened to a lot <laughs> of your uh, political junkies, I was going to admit, that uh, through, uh, through the years. So. Tell me, uh, you know, some of the things that kind of stand out from this first year, <coughs> and not all of them are things that, that you began, but, uh, you know, we, we talked about the defeat of riot boosting legislation, um, the, the recent court case about restriction legislation that was uh, designed to restrict circulators of ballot question uh, petitions. Uh, when you look back at the first year, uh, what are some of the things that you say, hey, here's, here's some of the su successes of, of this agency and what I really want to highlight? Well, I think we've had a lot of good information and a lot of good success story in the area of consumer protection. 
And that's a very broad category. Now, we don't talk, you know, presumptive probation yeah. and stuff gets all the headlines. Uh, you know, meth is more sexy a topic than, you know, talking about somebody's credit report. But that also affects people's lives. And I think, you know, we had the Equifax settlement uh, this last year. Uh, we had a, a case we joined from the U.S. Supreme Court about uh, trust issues. Uh, and I think that's a very big industry in our state that we've had a success for. Uh, we're actually involved in another case regarding the Electoral College. Uh, it's not gotten a lot of press yet, and we're waiting for cert. We're working with Colorado in a bipartisan effort there. Uh, but I think that we've had a lot of great awareness. We came in, I said I wanted to update some things, such as we had a consumer protection handbook. Uh, it hadn't been updated in five years, and we've done that now, and, and getting that message out. We went to a lot of the fairs and things and handed that out and, and answered people uh, proactively, and we're trying to get them to uh, you know sign up for our newsletter and stuff and learn what the latest scams are. I mean, we're trying to push out information all the time about what the latest scams are and how they take advantage of people. We had the floods and stuff and uh, blizzards, and who is there before the, it's almost before, uh, you know, the fire departments, there are the scammers, and how can we take advantage of people in their lowest moment when they've lost everything, and we're trying to get that awareness out to people. Okay. And uh, I think we've been very proactive in that area, and I think that consumer protection uh, has been doing a very good job, but uh, we're obviously involved in the opioid litigation. We're trying to help people in that, in that front. Uh, that's a ongoing weekly thing that we're involved in uh, that I think we are going to make some progress and we're going to get some relief back to the states uh, from that, uh, that either more medication where they can wean themselves off or other medications that they can use and also some funding for treatment uh, on that front. I think that's been a very positive development and not quite settled yet, but we're getting it pretty close. So just to be clear, on one day it might be the uh, county fair and <laughs> talking about consumer protection, and the next day it might be, let's plan our Supreme Court visit. You just Correct. never know which suit to wear. Well, <laughs> every, everybody <laughs> asked me, what, uh, what do I like about the job? And I said, well, first off, you're helping people. You're helping them on their day-to-day -day lives. It's not off in Washington, some obscure thing. You're actually affecting people's lives and trying to help them, uh, but it's variety. You know, I five or six major topics every day and uh, mm -hmm. uh, making decisions and, you know, obviously managing a pretty robust department. Let's uh, close with more about the Electoral College effort that you mentioned. Tell uh, me more well about there, that. Yeah. There, there's a case out of the uh, Tenth Circuit, Colorado. Uh, their, their attorney general is actually a Democrat, and I'm a Republican, but we've been working together. Uh, it was a case where somebody wanted to vote. Uh, they were bound to vote for Hillary Clinton, and he did not want to vote for Hillary Clinton, one of the electors. He wanted to vote for John Kasich of Ohio. Uh, they removed him from office uh, being an elector, and then he sued the state of Colorado. It was dismissed at the district level, and it went to the Tenth Circuit, which said, yes, he can vote for anybody he wants to. And I think that uh, we built a coalition of Republican and Democrat states. I have about 25 states that supported my brief uh, to the United States Supreme Court, and we'll know either Friday or Monday probably if, uh, we're gonna, if cert will be granted. Uh, but I think that's a way and an issue that everybody wants to know. It kind of goes back to the, what you brought up initially about the ERA. Everybody wants to know what the rules are and wants to know what the rules are fairly, not rewrite the rules 40 years later or here in this case. I think everybody wants to know in a, uh, obviously a very contentious national election most likely what the rules are going in versus having to decide on the back end once everybody has voted, you know, and having maybe another Bush versus Gore situation after the fact. I think everybody wants to know what the rules are. There was a Washington State Supreme Court that said, yes, uh, they could be fined or have consequences against them. So we think that there, since there's a split between the circuits and a one state Supreme Court, we have a pretty good chance of going to the Supreme Court. A, a national theme as well. What are the rules? How do we do this? And sometimes we find out the rules aren't as clear as we thought we were, and we can argue a whole lot on what uh, someone intended the rule to be. It's a, a fascinating time to be in your line of work. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, like I said, you know, there are a number of issues. While heavily political, like you know, electoral college and things yeah. like that, you still can work across the aisle and uh, work with uh, Republicans and Democrats. And I've encouraged all legislators here in South Dakota, all 105, I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, if you have a bill, please let us review it. There are some cases you mentioned. Uh, we want to make the best possible bill to defend it for the state and whatever the state's position is so we can adequately defend it. South Dakota Attorney General Jason Roundsburg, thank you so much for stopping by. We'll see you next time. Sounds good, Lori. Thank you.